Here we are, part two of my Unsolved Mystery documentary. Uh, we have very little time, but this is the article that I am going to read about Taj Narbonne. Like I said, we ain't got much time, so if we can get this out and get it, I want you to visualize it like I have, if you can. So when I read it, you'll get a visualism. And when we are done, to make a long story short, I'm gonna go over as much pieces as that I can for you to understand the story and see what you come up with in your mind. And I put this video looking old fashioned because it's an old story and I think it needs to be said in an old manner. But let's get the business. Like I said, I ain't got much time, but we will be going over this in the next probably two parts. And here we go. On Monday, March 30th, 1981, Taj Narbonne sat at his grandparents' kitchen table in Fitchburg dreading what was to become when he returned home to his mother and stepfather there that night. I told him he was going home, said Louis Narbonne, Taj's grandfather. He said with Caroline there, oops, sorry, with Clarence there. No way, Taj, nine, was referring to Clarence Dean whom his mother married when Taj was seven years old. According to Lewis and his wife, Eunice, Taj had been living with friends of his parents because he was terrified of his stepfather. After coming down with a cold that week, Taj stayed with his grandparents while he recovered. Lewis Narbonne recalled and when Taj's mother Annette called to ask that he be sent home to their apartment at 15 Naples Street in Lemonster. Her parents obliged. The thing is, it was rough. It still is. And I'll never forget Clarence, forgive Clarence or myself for letting him go back there. Eunice Narbonne, Taj's grandmother, said last week, Taj and her bone went missing the next day and was never found. 32 years later, the case remains open and police believe there's still information out there that can crack the case. Police treated it as a runaway case in the days and weeks after his mother reported him missing. Lemonster Detective Patrick Avishon, head detective, said the possibility, excuse me, possibility that Taj chose to leave and start his own life somewhere else is remote. And given his young age and the chilly early spring temperatures, Avishon, who leads the investigation into Taj's disappearance today, said why Dean didn't fall under more scrutiny after his stepson disappeared is puzzling. The investigation kind of got away from him, but everything points to him. Abishon said, the evidence against Dean is circumstantial in fact, police didn't collect any physical evidence that's still used in the investigation today. Anything that was collected has since been discarded because it wasn't re relevant, Avishan said. <clears throat> A stack of three ring binders filled with interviews, correspondence, and photographs about the case are what led Abishan to deem Dean a person of 
interest in the case. Dean treated Taj horribly, Avishan said. He wouldn't say whether he abused him physically, though he did say, Dean, a black man, mocked Taj, <clears throat> calling him the white king. These racial insults were born of the jealousy Dean felt about his wife's love for her son. According to Abishan, <clears throat> Taj's mother, Annette Long, divorced Dean in 1983. She said her suspicion about his involvement in her son's disappearance developed in June 1981 when he began to dis discuss unrealistic schemes aimed at finding Taj and it talked about getting a story straight in case the police questioned him. Her suspicions came to a head when Dean kidnapped and stabbed his estranged wife in a car near the Lemonster State Forest in Fitchburg in December of 1981. He served two years in jail for the assault, according to Long. Looking back, Long, who was remarried and now lives in New York State, said she and the police were remiss in not suspecting Dean from the start. Long recounted the chilling details of the night Taj arrived home. It was Dean who insisted her son to come home. He told her he wanted to do the right thing and make amends with the child, Long said. Long said she's been scheming to slip away with Taj and her one-year-old son when Dean wasn't home because she feared his bad temper and violent behavior. But she was just a week away from giving birth to another child and figured she and her children could bide their time with Dean for a bit longer. I have, of course, so much guilt and regret that I didn't stand up to him. But of course, I knew what he was capable of, Long said. Taj was paranoid that night, Long said, waiting with batted breath for Dean to arrive home from work. Long tried to calm her son, telling him Dean wouldn't be home until past bedtime. When he arrived at home about 11.30 p.m., Dean insisted he had, he, sorry, he and his pregnant wife have a beer together, Long said. I wonder, as I think back on it, did he want me to be asleep, Long said. The couple went to bed around midnight, and for reasons unknown to her, Long awoke at about 1.30 a.m. Alone in bed, she got up, walked down the small hallway, and peered into the living room. Suddenly, Dean jumped into the room from a screened-in porch, trying to startle her in a joking manner. She said he jumped backward into the kitchen, knocking over empty beer bottles from earlier, she said. She told Dean he'd better go into Taj's room and tell him everything was okay because he might fear the racket meant trouble. Long said she want, now wonders whether Taj was actually in his bed at that point. She woke up the next morning and Taj was gone. Long, looking outside, thinking he might be waiting for his bus, but he wasn't. The clothes she laid out for him were gone, and she found a note supposedly left by him saying, 
I'm going away because I don't want to live here anymore. I don't have to listen to anybody anymore. Apparently that note laid the path for the investigation. Police interviewed Dean about Taj's disappearance, but they never took it further. Long said, Abishan said, while Dean is not an official suspect, he is a suspicious person in the case. He would not discuss most of the information in the case file because he said it could compromise the investigation, but he said there were many things he learned about Taj's disappearance when he reported the case seven years ago that were not reported during the initial investigation. Thirty years later, which is actually 32, you say why, Abishon said, today Clarence Dean is locked up at Bridgewater State Hospital because he is not mentally ill. I'm trying to go a little quick here as I'm running out of time, but according to Abishon, he's interviewed Dean in recent years, but he's often incoherent and the reliability of what he says is now questionable. The focus of the investigation today is not so much to find out who is responsible for Taj's disappearance without spelling it out, Abishan said, but he has a good idea who that person is. And that transpired the night before Taj was reported missing. The most important thing, Abishan said, is to find Taj police though they were close once back in September 2006 acting on what Abishan said was creditable tip local and state police uh, searched the woods for two weeks with search dogs at the end of the Christine Street which runs perpendicular perpendicular sorry I'm not familiar with that word to Naples Street which it runs cross, but I'll get to that. We will go all over this um, street where Taj lived. The dog, no, they dug up <clears throat> the ground in hopes of finding Taj's remains, but walked away frustrated with no answers. Despite a lack of results, Abishan said he still. He is still very interested in what might be buried in those same woods. It takes a lot of resource and time, but he would like to go back in there with search dogs again early in the morning when the scents are detected most easily. Long said she is unsure how she feels about the search for her son's remains. She wants an answer after 32 years of wondering what really happened in Tutaj, but the idea of finding his body is just so creepy, she said. Part of her still clings to the hope that he did run away to escape his stepfather and living happily somewhere. For years, Long was burdened with question about her son's fate, but she was able to finally let go of some of them in the mid 1990s she reflected on the special relationship she had with her son whom she gave birth to when she was just 18. Long described Taj as a gifted student an amazing little guy he was like my little friend and as well as my son Long said like I said I ain't got much time but I got a little time to end this up but we are going in the next two parts. I'm going to be going over this. <clears throat> Hopefully a catch of what I'm saying. But as you can see. <laughs> I mean. Wow. You know just listening to this. Over and over again. Is just. Brings so much. Energy inside my brain. That I want to think about it. And the more I think about it. The more I want to look. You know, but um, I will see you in the next two parts. We're gonna go over this story and see what comes up out of it. Maybe we'll get somewhere. 
or some volunteer work. So we'll see you in the next parts. Peace out. See you soon.